Hello recumbent spectators, I am Pruitt and this is Jim Davis. We are going to start you on a journey today, a new year, new DM journey. And we're gonna do that by getting back to the fundamentals. We're starting a new series called DM Basics. And as the staccato drums play in the distance, let us start with descriptions here on WebDM. Okay, Jim, as we cower alone in our individual uh, rooms, yeah. uh, a degree of, of, of uh, uncertainty in the air. Yeah, yeah. Why is it so important for description to uh, illuminate a DM's prose, so to speak? <laughs> thank you, thank you. As I swallow a thesaurus before I ask my first question. Uh, right, yeah. <laughs> Tip one, swallow with the source. Yeah, yeah. Just really get it in you. Um, why is it so why is description so important for a dungeon master? Like, like when you say it out loud, it feels really obvious. But mm -hmm. I think in like when it comes to dungeon master advice and tips, like the fact that so much of what you do as a as a DM is describe things, is establish this this sort of shared imaginative space that um it's easy to overlook that it's literally the most foundational skill that you will that you'll develop as a dungeon master like without being able to describe things and what they look like and, and what the environment's like the the outcomes of, of resol action resolutions like without being able to describe any of those things you don't really have a role-playing game <laughs> right you at best you have a board game where you describe things purely in mechanical terms um and yeah. and you don't really develop it as a as a fictive or narrative place you know a place where stories happen um and so i like it's easy to overlook but it literally is the most foundational skill and it applies to all rpgs in the broadest sense possible right we're, we're roping in story games we're roping in the adventure game right like they're all here big tent and description is the foundation on which everything else rests and, and like I mentioned a minute ago, it's, it is about creating the shared imagination space where you're, you know, as a, as a dungeon master in a traditional RPG, you are leading a group of people into this otherworldly place solely in their imaginations. And it's from that shared imagination space that people are making decisions about their characters. It can create fr uh, friction in a group also by what, what the tone or the theme or the genre of the imaginative spaces. And so being able to accurately depict and describe and set those boundaries is a fundamental skill for a dungeon master because everybody wants something different, you know? Um, so that's yeah. what I'd like for us to get down to is like, what's in our toolbox when it comes to describing? Okay, well, wh well why, don't we, uh, why don't we set the scene, so to speak, for our, for our viewers out there? Because like you said, this is... It is about establishing that shared space. Yeah. So, so let's. Where do we begin with that? Like, what what is your first thing that you're thinking of as a DM, as you're about to describe something to your players? Yeah, yeah. We are, <clears throat> we are specifically referring to like the scene, right? Not not mm -hmm. describing the campaign setting, not describing like the campaign setup or the first time you sit down, but like when they open the door, when they arrive at the place when they meet the NPC, whatever, that moment that you've entered a scene, this is one of the critical and key points. And in a traditional RPG, you are acting as the character's eyes and ears, the, you know, their senses, and thinking about the experience of being in this place from the character's perspective is the logical starting point here, right? Like we do, you do need to include more than just like sight, especially sight. Uh, whenever describing things from a character's point of view. And one of the ways you can do that is through language and description. And another way is to just like be open to letting the players ask questions about what their characters see and experience and make sure that you're mm -hmm. generous with that information because this is how they're going to make decisions, right? You know, it's just, uh, <laughs> it's just how this works. <laughs> Yeah, most definitely. And uh, remember, folks, uh, if you have any more questions for us at WebDM, you can go over to our Patreon and have access to us all the time. We get questions from patrons all the time, 
and we like to answer them as like warm up. We also do like things like a monthly hangout with our immortal level uh, uh, patrons. So check us on out over there. Um, all right, Jim. So when it comes to disseminating uh, these descriptions, like it's the most base. Uh, it's the most base part of like civilization and society and, and sharing it's the sharing of information. Right. Yeah. But there has yeah. to be a hierarchy, right? There you, you, our, our DMS out there need to know like what to think about first. So what's, what's, sure. what's your, what's your hierarchy of, uh, of, of information? Yeah. I, I think of it in terms of these, because this is where the prep and actual play meet, you know, the rubber meets the road on it. Right. Mm -hmm. And, for me, like the big difference between the sort of things I'll prep for myself versus using pre-published materials comes to this, right? I don't write out nearly as much as what would be in an adventure module. Um, but when I'm creating notes for myself and, and, you know, prepping for play, especially when I think of how I'm going to portray this element, whatever it is, to the, uh, to the players, I'm, I want to create for myself a series of prompts and notes that are going to get my imagination running, get my creative juices flowing, and at the same time provide me like the minimum information I'm going to want to convey uh, so that I don't miss anything, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so for me, it is a, it's a matter of anything I describe, if I can't get it, if I can't get a description out in less than three sentences, then I want to rethink that. Like, I want to rethink mm -hmm. what it is I'm trying to describe. Is it too complex? Is there too much going on? Is there a way I can break the description up so that I have an initial description that invites further inquiry and investigation? And that way I can parse out, you know, some of the more elaborate details of a scene or an NPC or whatever. Um, so that that initial, initial nugget <laughs> of information isn't so overwhelming and detail rich that the players lose track of what's going on, check out of the game, that kind of thing. So three sentences, yeah. three elements, that's kind of what I'm going for um, it, when I'm prepping uh, notes for myself. Mm -hmm. and, and what's usually, what, like, what do you want to have in the, those three sentences? Mm. So it's going to be more than three things. <laughs> <laughs> it always right. is. It always it is. Always has been. <laughs> right. Uh, and, and we're saying sentences here in, in sort of a looser sense. For me, they're usually bullet points, but sometimes I'll write out a full sentence if, if something strikes me as being particularly, uh, you know, apt for the description or something. But in these elements that I'm thinking of, uh, and, and this go into the actual description of a scene, what I'm looking for is to establish the environment and situation. Right. Is it a wilderness scene where it's sort of quiet and pristine and all these other sorts of things? Um, or is it a, uh, a, you know, a busy sort of urban scene, something like that? What's the initial impression, the initial environment, physical environment that the thing takes place in? Uh, and then from there, moving on to the sensory info, right? What, what are these, what are the characters senses, uh, uh, you know, experiencing as they go in here? And sight's the one people lean on the most, but it, the, obviously you don't want to have just sight uh, for this. So for sensory info, uh, you know, DMs rely a lot on on sight. It's it's sort of humans, <laughs> you know, one of our the big it's the big one I think you know, of probably how well, we process yeah. information. Yeah. yeah, we are sight based, you know, predator prey <laughs> animals. So right, you know, we're we're um, smell based quadruped predators. Sure, <laughs> right, you know, uh, but those senses are still there, right? And and more than just the big five. Um, you know, there's, there's sight, but when you're describing things from sight, it's not just like what something looks like, but paying attention to the colors, light and shadows, uh, what sort of activity or movement is there. Um, color is a big one for me because you can really, um, establish the mood of some place by the colors that you use to describe things, especially the ambient visuals, right? Like the things mm -hmm. around it, things in sort of the background. Um, sound is sort of another one where it's like, what ambient noises are there in this place? Um, which of them result from the environment? Which of them result from like talking or, or some other kind of verbal communication? And like as, as sort of thinking about the five senses here, what we're doing is making sure that we're consistent enough in our descriptions of sensory information 
so that when you give clues that are like something smells off, something feels off, this room seems to be tilted at a subtle angle that just makes everything seem weird, right? Like it just doesn't mm -hmm. seem right here that you're not tipping your hand that, that the hope, this is where the monster comes out or something, right? It's like in those old cartoons where you always knew what the characters are going to interact with because it's in a different animation style than what's in the background, you know, or the music changes, <laughs> right. Or the music changes or something by like mm -hmm. always giving more than one type of, of sensory info. You're sort of like masking and covering up those moments where you do want there to be genuine surprise. And so you'll see all kinds of things like always include three types of senses or whatever, go with what works for you. But just be mindful of the fact that if you suddenly start describing some kind of sense and you haven't done that up to that, your players might go, what do you mean? It smells weird, right? What do you mean? <laughs> we can taste this thing on the air, you know? Um, yeah. You know, what do you mean our, <laughs> that, that the pressure feels differently in here? Like that there's different textures to things, you know, that we touch or why are we suddenly paying attention to, you know, vibrations that we might feel? Um, you can use that to your advantage, but it might also, they, it might be one of those things that they pick up and run wild with, and you were just trying to throw in some color, you know? Um, right. <laughs> which is one of the pitfalls. <laughs> well, I mean, depending on how you, you know, being conscious of how you normally describe things, uh, I mean, that is that, but that can be a way for the DM to subtly, you know, it is the DM equivalent of the music changing, you know, a yes. slightly dutched angle on the, on the, yep. on the perception, knowing that there's some, some weirdness afoot. So it depends Sorry. on how you use it. Like, um, it can be a bit much, but you know, D and D is a slight game of poker. Uh, so yeah. It depends yeah, on how good you your poker face is. You've really got to develop yeah, description and a poker face are fundamental, you know? Um, mm -hmm. but th the reason why sensory information is so important, it's not just conveying like, actual like factual information about something but you're also establishing an atmosphere and a mood and a feel for the place and thinking about your encounters your scenes your rooms whatever in terms of the feel you want them to have can be very mm -hmm. very helpful because now you understand the purpose of why you're describing this thing in the first place uh and yep. that would be something that i try to include in those those three elements three sentences three bullet points and finally like for me ending on a prompt to action is super important because what I found the, the most often in, you know, when I'm a player and I hear something described to me is a sort of staticness or, or like pristineness to what is being described. And by mm -hmm. including a prompt for action, something that's like, where is the element of uncertainty in this description? Are you describing like a delicate equilibrium that, that the players can interrupt or, or you know, to, uh, that's a good thing, right? <laughs> uh, or like, is there a question that needs to be answered here? Like ending mm -hmm. on a note that says, this is what, this is one thing you can get involved with or, or something is a way to both let the player know my description is over. And now you have a chance to interact with it player. And the most basic way to do this is how do you, you know, what do you do next? Right? Here's the scene. Mm -hmm. What do you do next? Um, but you can get more specific than that, uh, as you, you know, as you develop your skills at describing. Yeah. The, the three basics for me are when I'm trying to describe a room, or at least the three things I try to always include, um, is dimensions, like the dimensions of the room in some way mm -hmm. doesn't have to be specific, but at least a general sure. idea, the condition of the room. Is it new? Is it old and musty? You know, yeah. is it been used, not used, abandoned? And then the contents inhabitants, like I, depending on, on what's going on in the scene, but that's like, those are, those are my three, like boom, boom, boom. As far as yeah. describing a room, because like, that's like, it is how I, how, how I perceive things, but mm -hmm. you know, I, I, I just want to at least get that base information. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Gotcha. Yeah, certainly. And I, I, I feel like that the best way to do these things is going from general to specific um, mm -hmm. this is very much a describing what's obvious about a place or a person or a thing first, especially if there's monsters there, right? Like lead yeah. off <laughs> with the monster. If you're talking about like a room or a, or a place that they're supposed to be, you know, navigating, it's supposed to be dangerous, lead with the thing of danger. 
and then you know describe well, around it you know <laughs> yeah if, if it's something that would draw the eye normally like it's not a hiding monster it's just a dragon <laughs> sitting there asleep sitting in there. the middle of a room they're yeah. probably gonna look at the dragon first so yeah. it, it would seem that yeah you should yeah. probably start with that yeah not to mention don't bury the lead describe, right don't bury the for, thank you don't bury the lead um, but not to mention the fact that like, if you have this big description of something and then end with the monster, it doesn't matter what you described beforehand. All they're going to care about at that moment is the monster. And then afterwards, they're going to ask you to repeat yourself. So mm -hmm. that's sort of one of those things that, that I find very important is as you're going from general to specific to point out and begin with the obvious, which is usually a, a monster that's in hiding. Um, but the, the, the sort of, you know, moving on from there and thinking more about like the purpose of of these notes for yourself. It's that you're wanting to embed your descriptions with bait, right? Like mm -hmm. you're, you're giving these descriptions and, and, and providing these, the context for what the, the decisions the players are going to make and what's going on in the game, because you're trying to bait them with, with, to interact with it. It's like, come here, look at, look into this thing, right? Like yeah. poke, poke this thing, touch it. Push that button, you know, <laughs> put that ring on, Yeah, put that ring on, you know, fight this thing, interact with this thing. And so, like, that's why I think having uncertainty is very important. Don't reveal too much. Don't explain how things work. Use language that suggests there's different ways to approach something or think of something. You know, um, if there's a question that needs to be answered or a question that the scene poses, what's going to happen with this location and these NPCs, that kind of thing. Don't answer it for the players. Don't even suggest answers unless it really seems like they're floundering. Just put it out mm -hmm. there and be comfortable with giving, you know, answer, asking questions that you don't even know the answer to yet. Um, and then to, to be careful as you're putting bait out there and, and getting them to, to think, getting your players to think in terms of what can I interact with? What can I, uh, you know, make decisions about to not drown out the important details with useless detail. Right. Right. And and this would be the uh, the sort of, you, you know, don't have to describe what a what a traditional tavern or a traditional graveyard or a traditional village sort of looks like. We, if you're playing traditional fantasy, you kind of know what those things are. And you so you don't have yeah. to go through and give a bunch of boring, boring, unnecessary details when what you really want are these things, these other things, the things that stand out about uh, the scene. Yeah, avoid the mundane details. Give them, sure, yeah. give them those things that could be clues. Yes, yeah, yeah. They'll fill in the rest, right? Your players have imaginations, and then if there seems like there's a discrepancy, they can ask, and you can work it out. All right, Jim. Um, I mean, we've 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 talked about you know describing things and and being the POV of the players and all that fun stuff. But what are some minimums. what are some specific techniques? Uh, that 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 GMs and DMs can uh, can can think about whenever uh, whenever describing. Yeah, yeah, and 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 here we're really talking about locations, uh, spe mm -hmm. spe specifically. Um, you know, that a lot of this can also be applied to NPCs, to combat, to to that kind of thing. But for me, like describing the physical environment is is really foundational uh, to this. It's, it's to me, it's the, one of the ones you're going to use the most. It's the type of description you're going to use the most. Um, so a couple of things to sort of consider when you're doing this. Um, do you use cardinal directions? Like specifically in a dungeon crawl, right? Like, do you use them? Like there's no right or wrong answer here. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, you know? I mean, it's fundamental that there are two different types of people, people who understand cardinal directions and people who want to know, oh yeah, go down to the temple, hang a right. If you've gone to the thieves guild, you've gone too far. Like they want location based dis directions versus cardinal. I'm I, of course, cardinal, uh, <laughs> but, but that's, yeah, yeah. I have a similar kind of like, I, I, for whatever reason, always know where the cardinal directions are, wherever I'm at kind of thing. It's just sort of what my mind thinks of. And so it's, mm -hmm. it's something I overlook that there are people who they're like, which, okay, which one was that again? Or, or they're just not you know familiar with it. I like using this style specifically in a dungeon because yeah. even though it's very metagamey, 
even though it's something that that you know depending on the system you might have had to pay a feat for to understand what the the cardinal directions what true, were what true north is yeah true north right you have to be a dwarf to do whatever but like this is not about portraying something from a uh from an in-character perspective oddly enough and contradictory to what we said a few minutes ago but it's about making it easier for the player to understand where they are in a space right your yeah. characters do not know which way north is south is whatever but if I tell you the west wall, the north wall, across the chasm to the south, they enter from the east. Like, your characters don't know that, but it makes it easier for you as a player to parse this information, make decisions about it. And I, I, I like to mix it up sometimes with in-character POV. So I'll say, all right, you know, this is the dimensions or this, this is the physical space as described using the cardinal directions. But thereafter... I'll make reference to the character's POV to your left, which is, might be the South, might be the Northeast, whatever. Um, and so that's how I sort of mix those two. But I mm -hmm. find the cardinal directions good because it provides this sort of constant uh, frame of reference for the players. And in the sense that an RPG is about players making decisions, like, <laughs> yeah, they might be making decisions as their character, but they as real people still need to understand what's going on. Oh, yeah. And and the thing is, is you could tie this into skill use. If, if they're searching a room and have a particularly good, say, perception role, maybe mm. their characters do know that, oh, no, that's the North Wall, you know, based yeah. on, you know, this mold that grows only on the north side of things, you know, like certain tree molds sure. or whatever. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I mean, that I don't know that that could be something no, that you I think could just right. put in perception. There. No, you're absolutely right. Perception, survival, certain feats, maybe class features. Um, you know, I think pretty sure there's a cantrip in fifth edition, like maybe Druid Craft provides this information or something for you. So, I yeah, mean, it's yeah. perfectly possible to 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 tie in like what the players know with what the characters know to provide that bridge between the two entities at the table <laughs> so that the metagaming yeah, is, the is kept to an acceptable level. <laughs> right. Um <laughs> And, and and to make it more immersive, right? Like the, the best part about description is going to be the fact that it creates an immersive environment. You can imagine yourself mm -hmm. somewhere different as someone different. Um, and so a lot of people don't like this exact style of description. They, they find it boring or mundane or not immersive enough. But like I said, I find it helpful for the players only as establishing a baseline and then moving on. Um, mm -hmm. But you can also do things right. uh, in relations you know, to each other, right? Oh yeah, totally. Yeah, the the location based uh, directions. Yeah, um, go to the temple. You know, hang a left there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so let's uh, let's add a new dimension to this conversation. Uh, let's, let's talk about it. physical dimensions. I mean, you know, right. when you go in a room, is it circular? Is it rectangular? Like how? Like how? What, what's? How do you see rooms whenever you're describing them? So if I am a, running a traditional old school dungeon crawl, you're gonna get measurements. 30 by 30. It's a 30 foot square room. You know, it's a 20 by 40 rectangle. I, again, this is for player ease, especially if there's a mapper. I appreciate it when I'm mapping, right? Although it doesn't always need to be there. Um, but if you're going for that style of play where it's like, you know where a secret room is because you've mapped everywhere around it and you go, hey, what's that cavity there? There might be something there. Then that kind of exactness is important to that style of exploration based play. And so if I'm not doing that, though, I'm not really going to give you dimensions, right? I'm just going to be like, it's a big room. It's a small room. Looks like all of you could fit in here comfortably. That kind of thing. You're getting very general descriptors and, and sort of things that establish a feel for a place than, than like an exact dimensions. And, mm -hmm. and before we move off from this topic, just to sort of address some things that I've seen in terms of like dungeon design and layout and mapping is it's okay to just use rectangles. Like it's perfectly yeah. fine in your rooms and your layout to just use rectangles. And number one, it makes it way easier on the players when you're describing things. If you just say like, yeah, pretty much every room is room shaped, right? There's no like star shaped rooms or weird blob shaped rooms or like rooms that are super, complicated with more than four walls they're just rooms what we're really going to get to is the interesting things i've put in them 
And it seems like mm-hmm. a lot of times when you hear like, oh God, I'm tired of seeing grids with straight corridors and all these things. It's like, that's an aesthetic thing that the DM is largely concerned with. Like you don't like the look of your maps. Okay. But have you talked to your players about what it's like to understand what you're trying to convey when you're dealing with all these weird shapes and layouts and things like that? So it's kidney bean it, shaped and you come right, in on the smaller yeah. side and it, the, the larger bean descends down deeper. Like I, I've right. been in those games and it's kind of like, I'm sorry, where are we at? Uh, yeah. What's going on? You know, like there are places where that's appropriate cave systems. Yeah. I understand that when I go in a cave in a fantasy game that we're not dealing with, with right angles and flat planes. Right. I just kind of understand that you can give me a general shape of something, you know, but if mm-hmm. we're talking like a dungeon crawl or a location crawl or something, buildings underground, whatever's constructed, like I'm, I think it's perfectly fine to just be like, yep, these are just boring old rectangles that I have stuffed full of very interesting and cool things, right? Like yeah. what's in them matters way more than their shape, um, which is why unless I'm doing a very exact players are mapping out the dungeon, I'm just going to use general descriptors. This is a big room. It's got a dome, you know? Maybe it has eight sides instead of four, you know, something like that. But really mm-hmm. going to focus on what's in it as opposed to its shape. Yeah, I, that's why, uh, in a, a big shocker, that's why I like the cipher system that has a more generalized distance uh, mechanic baked into the rules. Things are an immediate mm-hmm. distance away. That's about 10 feet. A short distance, that's yeah. 50 feet. Long distance is 100 feet. And all the powers and everything are, so the player's already thinking about things in those regard so it's like oh yeah this this room yeah it's a long it's 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 a it's really long but uh it's only a short distance wide and the players know okay it's like a 50 by 100 or something around there um yeah or thereabouts yeah Yeah, but yeah unless you're surveying (laughs) unless you're dungeon surveyors though you don't need (laughs) sometimes don't need to know that it's 101 feet by 49 and a half feet you know right right that's that's what i was about to say you know yeah (laughs) i I have played in games. I've been the the player of a character who's like, no, my guy has like a portable desk and like a charcoal on 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 paper and is sketching out the rooms. He's he's walked. That's why we're taking so long to walk anywhere. He's pacing himself out. And then we get back to home base and making a map of it. Right. Yeah. I'm transferring that information. But my guy has a, a pen and, or, or charcoal and paper out torchbearer over their shoulder, making sure they can see. Because it's important that we know where we are in this complicated labyrinth of death. You know, <laughs> like, I want to know how to get out. I want to know where the secret places are if I have to hide somewhere. Um, and so, like, we focus on the dungeon a lot in this one because the dungeon's really a, a useful tool for a lot of things. Once you learn how, you know, you learn the fundamentals of the dungeon, you can apply them to just about any uh, scenario. And so being able to describe it is is one of those foundational things. And, mm-hmm. like looping back to what we talked about at the top of the show, like including all kinds of information, including things that, that are act as clues or bait, uh, or, or, you know, context contextualizers for the players. This is where you start going like, yeah, the lighting in this room is like this. This is the ambient noise. This is what it smells like the feel of the air, right? You can taste blood or ozone or whatever it is on the air to let you know, you know, X, Y, Z. And once you start doing that consistently, then you can start adding in things to your uh, dungeon design that let the players know, like, this is the decision point, right? When you hit that classic T intersection and you're like, okay, which way should I go left or right? And you've provided no context information, then it's a crapshoot, which way they go. Does it matter at all? But if you provided context for them, you make that decision meaningful because they can say, all right, well, that way that's covered in cobwebs and old bones seems like maybe nothing's been there in a while, despite the menacing look to it, as opposed to this hallway, which is wet with muddy boot prints. And we can maybe hear the faint sounds of something going on down there in another part of, you know, with some room or, or whatever that's way down there. Like that's much better than you come to a T intersection. You want to go left or right? You know, and, and if you can start working in ways of describing the place as they move through it, not just when they reach a set location and doing it quickly and, and without too much cruft, fluff, filler, 
um, that you make it meaningful. This is how you make a dungeon crawl or a location crawl or whatever, a city crawl mm-hmm. meaningful and not boring and, and just like, yeah, let's get past this to the next fight kind of, uh, you know, kind of mindset that develops. Yeah, and, 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 uh, and GMs can sometimes feel a little overwhelmed by that, by having to mm-hmm. provide detail, uh, explicit detail as they move through uh, a dungeon or a location. Uh, yeah. But, I mean, <clears throat> there's ways around that. There are a lot of helpful ways, uh, like, I don't know, tables? <laughs> tables? Like random tables? Really? <laughs> no. Yeah. You sure? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Oh my God, random tables are, your, are so much your friend for description, right? Yeah. Like, whether it's room contents for those empty rooms in a dungeon, and, and we'll do a show on dungeons and it'll tell you why empty rooms are important. Um, but you don't want them to be featureless. You want there to be something in there. Uh, and, and similarly with like, you know, you're going to some place or the players are going to some place that you didn't anticipate and, and you don't have a description set up for it. But if you have a good set of random tables that you can use to generate uh, enough information to kickstart your imagination, it's all you need, just a seed to get your imagination going. Yeah. Then you can really um, you can really have the confidence that the players can go anywhere they want and you will be able to provide them with something. And once you gain that confidence as a DM, then your players will gain the confidence going on their own and doing their own things. Mm -hmm. Lists of things that might be in a place, lists of colors, uh, lists of, uh, you know, just general descriptors, right? Adjectives that you can use beyond the, 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 you know, the, the most obvious ones. Getting a thesaurus and looking it up and going like, I want this place to seem menacing what are all the synonyms of menacing so that you just have them handy right um you know off color not off color but like different types of names for the colors other than blue red yellow you know are Mm -hmm. are another way to do this just like adding in something just a little different than 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 what's normal or mundane or what first comes to mind can be enough to make a description colorful and evocative and and like useful you can reinforce that with random tables. Just put it in a table, have it right there. Need to roll the die, roll it. If not, pick it off the table, you know? Mm-hmm. I mean, that's honestly, when it comes to stuff like that, because I use that all the time, I don't roll. I just like, oh yeah, that looks good. You know, a yeah. decrepit desk and some some cabinets and a, and a, and a broken down bookshelf with remnants yeah. of tomes. Like, you know, like, because yep. that's what I love about all those random tables like that. Um, uh, it, it, it's just... It's it's a nice cornucopia to just choose from. Um, yeah, yeah, and you're and you're giving your imagination a break. Like one of the things about improv that I find doesn't really get talked about enough is that if you don't prep for it, then you're just going to keep coming up with the same stuff and you're going to burn your imagination out. Whereas, like to mm-hmm. me, successful improv requires quite a bit of prep so that I have the confidence to just improv it, just wing it. Because I know that Mm -hmm. if I need something, I've built a structure for myself. I've built tools for myself. And if Mm -hmm. I get into trouble or it looks like I'm losing the audience, I can try something different. And that's why uh, these like random tables as a stand in for just like general tools that you have at your disposal um, is really vital for uh, for this, especially the big dungeon crawl. Come on. Oh, yeah. Well, and also uh, to, to move right along with that point about improv in, in your GMing, like, you know, there are times whenever, uh, you know, you don't have obviously every little bit of detail written out and your players go to an area and you start to wing it a bit. Um, that's it's important uh, in those moments, though, uh, to be consistent Yeah. in your descriptions. Right. Certainly. Certainly. Yeah. Consistency here is is really key. Like. Colorful and consistent are the, are the two watchwords that I have with uh, when I'm thinking of what I'm describing. Brief, uh, it's three words, four if I really think about it. Anyway, uh, seven <laughs> words. <laughs> seven words. Wait a minute. Uh, so wait, this isn't the Spanish Inquisition. Never mind. <laughs> no, this is this is right. Consistency is super important here. You are providing information that the players are going to make decisions on. And if the players are making decisions about things that you're not being consistent with, then there that's when you get ca- cases of like, well, if you'd said that, I would have made a different choice. You know, hey, DM, mm-hmm. 
this is the way it was last time. Why is it different this time? Wait, you said that this place was in this location, like this item was there or this person can be found in this place, but now you're saying something different. Like not only are you undermining the, the world that you're building, this shared imaginative space, but you're also like not doing a lot of, <laughs> not doing a lot to uh, establish trust in your players. Mm -hmm. And this is where like the fun of being freewheeling and off the cuff and rolling with it and, and just winging it can meet the hard wall of, dungeon mastering is work sometimes and maybe your players don't care maybe they're not bothered by it or or you're like me and you can go like well what was it like last time guys does anybody remember <laughs> you know mm -hmm. and lean on the player's memory of it which is fine um like being consistent and and having that consistency is important and the work of it is like writing it down making note of it um yeah. developing it you know that's that's kind of another DM 101 type uh, type skill there. This right here is my best friend. This, oh, yeah. This right here, just yellow notepads. I have yellow notes from games <laughs> on my desk all the time because oh, yeah. in those moments where I wing it, if I tell them something specific about an NPC or place, I write that note down and then I integrate yeah. it into my notes after the session because... Yeah. One of the things for me, and you know this, Jim, if if my suspension of disbelief is broken, I'm done. I'm just like, I'm well, this doesn't matter then, huh? Uh, so it, so we can just we're just we're make we're having fun, make believe fun time, huh? Like that's yes, the part where yeah. I really do like to take the game seriously because yes, it, because we've all agreed to come together and do this thing, and if you if random facts are just getting thrown out and it doesn't matter, well then why am I writing notes? Why did I make this character? Like, you know, it's not like I, like I'm not just gonna like sue someone over it or anything or go into <laughs> right. a nerd but rage gonna... blog and <laughs> get the Snyder cut brought back. You know, <laughs> sure, sure, you know. <laughs> Looking forward to that one. <laughs> but it, it is important, like, when you are throwing things off the cuff, it's okay to just write a little note down and, and just right. so your players can can feel like the curtain is still there. Like they haven't peeked behind and seen Oz. You yeah. know, the, Maintain the kayfabe. Yeah, totally. And, just, and again, yeah, we've like we already talked about, this goes back to the poker face. It's all part of your poker face that, oh, yeah, this is all, this is all the same. This is, you know, I've had all this down from the beginning. I've had it all down from the beginning. Yeah. And, and, and part of, part of developing that poker face, part of developing that ability to keep the, the illusion up and the good part of the illusion of DMing, um, is just getting confident when you talk about your game world and what's going on in it. And like, you're mm -hmm. going to present stuff to the game world to, you know, to your players that you don't have the answers for, but they don't need to know that, right? You're going to present things to your players that you just came up with right off the top of your head. They don't need to know that. You know, there's there's all of these ways that as a DM, you can undermine what you're trying to build by being too open. But that doesn't mean you could be entirely closed off because there are moments where you need to be able to say, I don't remember. I, me as the person <laughs> did not remember, didn't write this down, lost track of it. Um, so you should feel comfortable being open and honest in that sense. And yet at the same time, be comfortable keeping things close, keeping things hidden, lying, deceiving, you know, obfuscating things in order to maintain this beautiful lie that you're creating with your players. And mm -hmm. so, you know, this is this is a matter of practice of just getting used to mm -hmm. it. What kind of descriptions do your players like? What what sort of elements do you do they respond to versus not? I can't. I think part of the reason why I, I think we're sounding a little vague is because every table is so different. And even the ones that I've GM'd for and, 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 and the like, I've had to alter my style so much. Mm -hmm. I really can't say you should always do it this way. <laughs> you know, create the environment that your players yeah. respond to that requires time. Yeah, most definitely. Correct. Um, and, 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 you know, when it comes to uh, details and 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 well, it's it's it is the fluff of the scene, right, Jim? I mean, it's you're you're giving them a little bit uh, a little bit something to work on that, but it is actionable uh, and yeah. and and 
and having them parse through what is actionable information and what is not. And how do you yeah. how do you keep that that dividing line uh, secure in your mind? Ooh. I mean, I if I say it, I'm ready to take it seriously. Like yeah. if, if I give a description of something and a player goes, wait a minute, I could do this with it. Like there might be times when I go, wait a minute. All right, let me let me backtrack. Yeah. But, you know, but off, more often than not, I'm more concerned with maintaining the integrity of this place as an as, as an, a shared imagination exercise. Right. Shared imaginative space. That if I let slip something that is non-vital, but nevertheless, the players take it and run with it and do something unexpected, or, or maybe you might consider overpowered or circumventing something that I thought was going to be a real challenge, then like, okay, like that's just how it goes. And so for me, the, the fluff of the description can easily become the crunch of the mechanics, right? Mm -hmm. And vice versa. If I describe a bunch of things in an environment that, that could be used in combat, and then the players are like... I want to jump off this thing. I want to swing on that thing. I want to use this as cover. Like I'm prepared to have that be represented mechanically in the game. And so this is why consistency is so important uh, with that. Mm -hmm. Most definitely. Uh, um, <clears throat> and uh, also the fictional elements of a scene uh, are, are, are very important. Um, whether it's, you know, just objects or if it's NPCs, it doesn't really matter. Mm -hmm. Um, but, but those are, those are so important so that players can maintain agency, right? Yes, very much. Yeah. The, the consistency there is, is not just about shared imaginative spaces, but it's also consistency so that the players feel like they really have agency and you're holding yourself accountable because you're like paying attention to what you're saying. Uh, you know, if you, you plant it out if you need to, um, but otherwise you're prepared to like, once it's been said, it's been said, and we're not just going to keep going back and forth, um, and the like. Uh, so yeah, it is important for maintaining uh, player agency as well as like creating something really cool and immersive, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and furthering that into like your NPCs, like being consistent with your NPCs is probably, Unless you have a wild, like a chaotic neutral NPC, uh, mm -hmm. you know, y you want to make sure, unless it's important for the story element, if it's a doppelganger yeah. who's taken over, then yeah, of course, being consistent, that is a, in itself a clue, right? Right. Yeah. And if you've been consistent and then you start portraying inconsistencies, then your players can go like, wait a minute, that's different. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, again, why just sort of practicing and getting a feel for what your players like can be important because then you get to do a lot with it. Um, and so, yeah, it applies to NPCs. It applies to locations. There's all different kinds of, of, uh, situations this applies to. That's part of why we're being a little vague and, uh, and nonspecific about it because really anything you introduce as a fictional element benefits from these techniques, right? Mm -hmm. What we've talked about is a DM, they've narrated the scene, they've set it, the players have interacted with it, and now you have an outcome of that interaction that has to take place. Like this yeah. is the next part of your, your, your GM or your DM interact of, uh, excuse me, your, your DM or GM description is narrating the outcomes of players involvement in the scene. So how, how do you, uh, how do you, how do you take that on? Yeah. Oh yeah. You're absolutely right. The, the, the second like big application of description is, is narrating outcomes. Um, Gosh, I, so would say, here's what, how do you want to do this? How do you want to do this? Right. Yeah. That's, that's literally, uh, what he's asking. Um, so I, I like to do a couple of things, keep them in mind. Uh, one of number, the number one thing is for me when narrating outcomes is, are we assuming character competence, right? Like, are we assuming that the characters are competent individuals, competent at what they do? and that the outcomes of their actions reflect that competency, even if they're failures, right? Because I find like one of the biggest tonal shifts in an RPG when I'm playing and, and sort of like you with suspension of disbelief, this is going to throw me right out, is when we're playing as, you know, hardened warriors and, and, and you know, potent wizards and the like, or, or you know, whatever. 
for the outcomes as they're narrated by the GM to suddenly shift genres into slapstick and, 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 you know, or, or comedy or something like that, because the description of the outcome is not consistent with the kind of game that we've established. And so there's ways to sort of avoid this. One of them is player involvement. Another is understanding what failure means and how to portray it. But like, this moment of saying, okay, you rolled the die, you made a decision, you know, you told me what you did. Here is the outcome of that can really either, you can either reinforce the sorts of game, you know, the sort of game that you're playing uh, and the type of setting that you're trying to establish, or you can completely undermine it uh, in, in this sense. And, mm -hmm. and you can do it with, in, in terms of like describing failure in a way that, that undermines it. But you can also undermine it by like letting the players get away with too much, you know, like you've described a bunch of, you know, elements in a location or a bunch of facts about an NPC and then they want to go wild with it. Um, you know, that's, that's, and all, you know, you, you're saying, yes, you know, you're, you're doing all the, the, the you know, things that you're supposed to, you're a fan of the characters, whatever. Um, and yet you find yourself with this, this moment of narrating an outcome that's like, incongruous with the kind of game that you're wanting to run and setting you want to portray. So this is mm -hmm. another one of those areas where like thinking about it, practicing, developing techniques for yourself that get you the kind of game you want is very important. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, here we are. Uh, yeah, I mean, I definitely, because um, I find for me as a player, uh, especially like a martial artist who, <laughs> like if I'm playing a monk, and I throw three attacks in my head, I know exactly what that looks like. But then yeah. you roll your attacks and the DM just goes, yeah, you just throw a couple of punches to his face and yeah, you hit him. Like yeah. as a GM, like you need to know, like some players would like to narrate their own strikes to a point. Yeah. Right. And yeah. so that's, that's a player like that to me, that's like, Hey, GMs take a load off. If you have a player who's mm -hmm. super descriptive and likes to, go through how like you know you don't want them to hog all the spotlight you know for their their but if they're just a fighter who rolls two attacks and he knows immediately if he hit or miss and how much damage he did versus looking up a spell and figuring out how it works in the area and how many enemies they can catch it's to me it's like yeah give those players a little bit that's how, that's how you give them their time in the spotlight let them describe those slashes cutting into the enemy sure. and blood spraying you know that kind of stuff um because it's yeah. a it's a load yeah. off your mental burden it it certainly is and and like we can even expand the 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 concept that we're talking about here out out from just narrating outcomes to just narrating actions and outcomes in this sense yeah and especially when it comes to player involvement because i find that this is an area where players want to have a lot of involvement and this pre critical role as well like everybody loves to talk about what their character does in combat what their magic looks like things like that oh yeah and and yet the flip side of that is it can bog down play. It can create these incongruous outcomes where it's like, wait a minute, you, you can't do that. <laughs> that is in fact what your character can't do, even though it sounds <laughs> <Yeah>. awesome, uh, <laughs> you know? Uh, and so striking the right balance, finding what works for your group is very important. For me, I'm less interested in narrating my actions as a player uh, or, or necessarily their outcomes as I am in, in just like keeping a good pace for the game. So as a player, I'm okay going, yeah, my fighter attacks, but I might describe it as something like, yeah, my fighter goes in aggressively. They're trying to like really, you know, press things hard, you know, overwhelm them. I'm going to keep it really super short, roll the die, not ever going to describe anything before the die is rolled, either when I'm a player or a DM, and then let that die roll speak for what the outcome looks like. Um, in a traditional RPG, the GM does narrate the outcome. Uh, that's sort of like mm -hmm. first 10 pages of the PHB somewhere. That's sort of what it uh, describes. But this is also one of those areas where you can't say, what does this look like? How do you do it? Um, and I, it can be very fun. Some players love it. But if it if it's bogging down your table, if like combat's taking twice as long because everybody's describing and getting super into what their characters are doing and what it looks like, or how they, you know, navigate a city. These are fun things to do. This is what makes a game engaging and immersive and, and real for the players involved. But it also takes up time and it can, it can add up in little bits <laughs> to realize like, mm -hmm. 
oh shit, it's taking us 45 minutes to get through an entire round of combat, <laughs> uh, as evocative and descriptive as that is. So when you're thinking about player involvement, like from a DM's perspective, understanding what it is that you are rel relinquishing control of talking specifically for a traditional RPG here. There's other RPGs out there and story games and the like where this doesn't apply, but you are giving permission to the player to say, you know what? Normally I, as the GM would be doing this, but I've got other things to do, or I think this is a cool moment, or I don't want to tell you what your character's doing kind of thing. And now you, as a player, now you have the opportunity to add to something to describe it. And the important thing here is to just follow the same principles as the dungeon master. Keep it short, keep it evocative, mm -hmm. have it be consistent with the tone and theme of the game so far. And like, just get it done and move on with it and including yeah. like hey i don't really want to do this my guy chops them <laughs> you know the spell goes off that kind of there's plenty mm -hmm. of times where it's like how do you how do you want to do this jim uh, my guy hits him and it's hard can we move on <laughs> <What? Yeah. laughs> well, yeah well yeah like you said like in my head about... it's way cool i just don't want to talk about it <laughs> yeah 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 <laughs> that's a, that's gym time um right. no i i <laughs> Also, yeah, with, with players, you know, if if the if the GM doesn't say that it's a big hit or something, don't say yeah. And I cut his arm off, like just because you did, just because oh, you critted and did twenty two damage. It's like, well, yeah, but that no, it, no, because yeah, he well, still hits you with that. That's a mechanical effect. Yeah, what, what yeah. does that look like? Yeah, <laughs> um, and that, but that that applies to so much though, right? Like, yeah, what you're narrating the outcome for that the players might go, oh wait, well does that mean this, you know, and not just combat, the, re the resolution of any sort of action can produce this thing. So there's a time and a place for like, oh man, that was a really good hit. Or you like rocked that skill roll. I'm the, here's a benefit. Here's a bonus. Here's something extra. Wouldn't it be mm -hmm. cool if now let's take that seriously and have this apply to the game world. You know, you did cut off their arm. Yeah. They, they don't have that arm anymore. This is bad for them. They're probably going to stop fighting, <laughs> you yeah. know, unless they're crazy or like a yeah, troll wow. or something uh, <laughs> oh definitely no, definitely sure. or a crazy um, troll. right but um it, the rather than like successes and 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 the like um the big one for me what i find is the biggest mood killer for an rpg when i'm playing is failure that is described as inconsistent with how i see my character and how i see the game and because failure seems to be one of those things, describing failure rather, seems to be one of those things that GMs don't ever relinquish <laughs> to, to their mm -hmm. players or very rarely do, as opposed to like the crit hits or whatever, uh, that you get these sort of stale and repetitive, like you, how, how many times did we play Pruitt where it was like, oh, I crit fumbled that, that attack and okay, well you hit yourself or your friend or your bowstring broke. We're just like, it suddenly just devolves into the worst sort of slapstick, incompetent comedy that you could imagine, despite the fact that we're over here being like 14th level adventurers, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're a first level adventurer in Dungeons and Dragons. Maybe you're a warrior type, whatever. You use a weapon, right? You're not a pure spellcaster. Uh, you're a competent adventurer because you're a Dungeons and Dragons character. In any edition of D&D, &D, a first level character is a competent adventurer. Otherwise, they wouldn't be there. You've gone into some dangerous location. You're, you know, you've risked it all in order for this one chance to make it rich or get what you need, something to save your family or someone you love, or you're doing this for personal reasons. And you come across an enemy and you think that this is going to be a battle for life and death. This is what you've prepared for, right? You ready your weapon, mm -hmm. you charge into melee. And then the dungeon master proceeds to describe a bunch of whiffs and gaffs and guffaws as the two of you uselessly flail away at one another in a non-epic mood killing battle. Now, some might say that's a problem of the whiff factor of the D20. And the fact that not every time you roll, you hit and that combat takes too long because there's a whiff factor. That's a different argument. You could have an epic battle though, and it is entirely up to how you describe a series of misses in a game like Dungeons and Dragons. And if every miss that you describe is a whiff, is, is representative of some sort of gross incompetence. And after you get done with a combat that's filled with a bunch of like no hits, you go like, why is my character here? Then that's like, 
you you're like it, it's so antithetical to the kind of experience i want in D D. it's hard to describe ironically you know it's mm -hmm. it you don't have to have that outcome where you feel like your adventure is incompetent and that they shouldn't be there if you just narrated it better rather than a series of whiffs it could be like these are a series of just near misses parries and dodges and and you know you strike their shoulder armor it's a glancing blow like all of these things contribute to the feel of a fight and so if you find yourself thinking like man lower level dnd &D really sucks because we're just like the whiff factor is too high or or i feel like my character can't do anything that they're constantly striking out and not getting what they want like Consider that describing those failures in a way that's more consistent with how you see your character, that the failures might not have come from them, but from environmental factors, from something someone mm -hmm. else was doing that made it more challenging or that messed them up, or that the failures aren't representative of, like we mentioned, gross incompetence, but the skill of someone else, right? In combat, something can be epic and tense and dangerous based purely on how you describe it. And, and if you find that your games are lacking in that epic feeling, uh, a feeling of heroes doing battle against the forces of evil or, or exploring these supernatural and wondrous places, then maybe don't look to the rule set and maybe look to how it's described. Because in my experience, every time I've been like, wait a minute, my character's better than that, right? <laughs> my character's an eighth level barbarian or a you know, second level fighter or whatever, like, this isn't the first time they've picked up a weapon. You know, there's a time and a place for things to break and drop and whatever. But they're not <laughs> I feel like they should be less, uh, you know, with a less frequency than just, yeah, you barely missed. Right. Like, all right, that that strike that you attempted to make, like they parried it, but the, they've got a look of fear in their eyes. They saw how close you got. Uh, mm -hmm. especially if you're interpreting the die rolls, incorporating them into your descriptions. Um, but, you know, that that's an example of combat, but you could do the same thing with, like, picking locks, climbing, navigating an environment, talking to people, right? How you describe failure is so important to keeping the momentum of the game going, to keeping player enthusiasm going. Like, you can really ruin a player's night if they're on a hot streak and just, or not, the anti-hot streak. <laughs> cold i guess on a not it. a not straight uh, yeah. uh, <clears throat> right like this happened to me the last few times i've played in different rpgs which is like i cannot I, the dice are just going against me and I, I i could feel that i could be taken out of the moment i could feel just like shitty and and like i don't want to play this game uh, and you know describing failure as incongruous with how i see my character can really help that along <laughs> and make it really bad how I conceive of my character and how the game has portrayed them so far is taken into account when the player in DM takes that into account, then even a streak of misses, I'm still involved in the game. I'm still engaged because my character's still there as I understand them. Even though the misses are there, the failures are there, my character is still my character. Then I'm going to be engaged. I'm going to be ready. And this is really one of those things that I find increasingly is like one of my number one pet peeves when playing with other dms is just mm -hmm. like come on up your game <laughs> dm give me a yeah. better description of failure than what i got yeah and I've, I've only had a couple of dms do this but like you know that moment whenever you roll and you finally figure out their ac and it's like 18 you roll 18 to hit and their ac is 18 so you don't do damage but guess what that can be a moment where like maybe you cut them across the cheek and that's where they're like you almost got them but Again, a cut across the cheek is a superficial wound. Ergo, it's not going sure. to hinder them at all. So it doesn't even need to take away from their hit points. So you can have those moments where you bloody someone's lip and they give you that, uh, and then wipe it off mm -hmm. and come right back at you. Because, yeah. yeah, you gave them a pop, but it's not enough to actually hinder them. And so, yeah. like, incorporating some of those in those near misses, you rolled a 17, you needed an 18. You know, you met yeah. their AC but didn't go over. Like, remember those moments and let that be a lesson because now you, 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 your players are going to be like, oh, I smell blood. I, I, I know I can yeah. get them now. You know, like, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. It, you can really influence a game by how you how you describe failure. And I know we've mostly been talking about combat here. I feel like describing combat is its own show entirely. 
because um, yeah. there's a lot of abstraction and a lot of what it looks like. But you can take these fundamentals and, and principles and apply them to just about anything, you know, mm -hmm. NPC interactions, you know, exploration challenges, whatever the outcome is, uh, you can. I think combat is where it, it, it looms the largest, though. And it's certainly, the, you know, you do the most die rolling there, right? Yeah. Oh, definitely. Um, all right, Jim. This is something uh, we're gonna we're gonna let's go ahead and get around to this. Yeah. Let's let's talk about. I want I want to I want to get your uh, I want to get your hot take on box text. I want you to hot box me, Jim. Hot box. Uh, All right. Let's do <laughs> like because this. this is a fundamental descriptor in pre-published adventures. The box text, and uh, yeah, you know, Certainly novels is. have been written <laughs> literally. <laughs> In the, in the boxes of text, yeah. yeah. <sighs> deep breath. Box text, yeah, deep breaths. You're right, it is one of the most common forms of description uh, that are presented to DMs. And as such, I think a lot of DMs sort of internalize what the box text, uh, you know, have the forms that it takes and the contents of it, and then want to present that in their own games. And for me, box text is one of those things like encumbrance, or, or, you know, counting gold pieces that like, I don't think we should work. I don't think we should throw the baby out with the bathwater. The point isn't to get rid of descriptive text that a DM can read to their players. Like in that sense, box text is very important. It helps establish everything we've been talking about here. And as well as separating it from information that you as the DM might not want the players to know. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, Keeping it short, keeping it sweet, keeping it evocative is very important. And unfortunately, a lot of the box text out there is just terrible. I, you know, I've, it's just, it's terribly written. It's terrible prose. It, it's, it does not convey the information that it needs to. It assumes a lot of things about the characters and the environment and their actions and what's going on. Many times it's presented from a point of view that is appropriate for a novel and not like what the characters are seeing at that mm -hmm. moment. And like, it is, I think like one of the biggest contributors of the impulse to tell DMs, don't be a fantasy novelist. And, and if I'm getting like multiple paragraphs of detail, rich, but otherwise not particularly evocative prose and being read to, I'm like, I'm checking out. I, you got me for maybe at best 30 seconds before I'm, I'm done. And I, I think everything after that 30 seconds is unnecessary to be given in one big chunk, right? There might be stuff in there that you want to include and that is vital, but to present it all up front, all at once, and without any differentiation between what's fluff filler detail and what's important to understand what I can do in this scene is just bad practice. And I do not understand why it persists. Like I get why box text is there. DMs want it, helps them out. New DMs, it's great. You know, use it, learn what you like about it and, and develop something, you know, that builds off of it. But the multi-paragraph, super detailed box text, I, I'm really at a loss. The, the only thing I can think of is that it's there for people who just read RPG adventures and don't play them. Yeah. Which is a substantial amount of people who are buying RPG products, right? Like, let's be honest, uh, including myself at times. But mm -hmm. that's who I feel it's there for. Most definitely. Can't stand it. Mm. I just don't. I, just, I mean, we could probably do a whole show on it by itself. So you really, we really could. We really could. My, my one piece of advice for you is read it aloud by yourself the first time and then make adjustments. So Jim, we've given, a, we've given DMs a lot to think about here, but lot, how about we, yeah. let's, 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 let's wrap this up with just some, some general exercises uh, that DMs can do to just kind of to pr to work on your craft, to practice your craft, so to speak, right? Yep. Yep. First one that I can think of, first exercise you can do to, to up your description game is read, 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 read. Fantasy fiction, non-fantasy fiction, non-fiction. Um, you know, this is one of those things where books and, and articles or whatever written by journalists about another subject tend to be very good. Like this is why history books written by journalists are better than history books written by historians, much to historians chagrin <laughs> well, <laughs> because <yeah. laughs> you're taking the, the, the dry facts of history, which is a jumbled mess and then creating a narrative out of them. Uh, and so people that are 
learn to do that rather than study historical facts tend to be better at it. Surprise, surprise. Um, and so travel writers, right? Like just people who travel and describe the places and people and things that they do. Getting a feel for multiple types of writing, multiple types of description, like it gives you a bigger palette to work with. And, and especially if you look for things in writing that are going to correspond with what it is that you're doing, right? Like, so tr that's why I say travel writing, um, you know, natural histories, anything that's like, I'm not sure the technical term for it, but anything that's like, I studied this animal, <laughs> you know, <laughs> or this natural environment. And, and here's what I learned. Here's what I observed. It's just going to give you a better sense of, of how things can be described in evocative and concise manners. And, and especially if you go outside the traditional fantasy uh, literary genre, which at this point has been influenced by itself and Dungeons and Dragons so much that it might not be helpful. Uh, you know, it might just make the problem worse if you're having difficulty with descriptions. But yeah, reading stuff is like number one. Read, 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 read. Oh, yeah. Read. You got to get that input so you can have more output. I mean... Yes. That's just, yeah. That's basic. Yeah. <laughs> Fill up that imagination fuel, baby. Come on. Uh, <laughs> next one is describing places or objects that you've been. You know, classic mm -hmm. example is what room are you in right now? Describe it. Describe it as if you were having to describe it to your players in using the principles that we talked about. Short, evocative descriptions. Um, same with objects, things like that. You can take it to a next level and find things that you would otherwise use in your uh, games like inspirational images or whatever, and then practice describing them to yourself, really write it down. You know, if you want to, if you're going to write it down, edit it and read it out loud before you present it to the players. <laughs> That's just, please, it'll make it better for you. It'll make mm -hmm. it, it can really elevate what you present to your players. If you are going to write it out and think about it, you know, ahead of time to edit it and read it out loud, read it to someone who's not a gamer and, ask them if they can understand it, especially for big stuff. Right. Um, what I would say, uh, you know, is another tip, uh, or exercise that you can do is to take box text from an adventure. Even if you don't plan on using that adventure, read it and distill it down to its essential parts and try to rephrase it. If you do want to maintain what you like about box text, then finding examples of them that you like, and, and figuring out what it is you like about them, as well as finding examples that you can't stand and then rewriting them so that you do like them is going to help with this as well. Um, mm -hmm. And surprise, surprise, almost all of this involves reading. So read, 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 read. Uh, <laughs> and those, you know, if you're looking to up your description game, that is certainly where I'd start. Um, I have some do's and don'ts, but uh, I don't know if we have time well, for those. I mean, well, I was going to well, say, you know. like, what, a, what we were talking about the other day, like an old exercise of just, like, describe making a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. And, like, yeah. the important descriptive, pe like, steps, like, every step. Because you, yeah. you, you read it out and you're like, oh, well, wait, where'd the bread come from? Right? Sure, <laughs> like, sure. <laughs> you know. Yeah, yeah. That and helps you like that, just identify... So, just so you, I mean, ahead, just sorry. so you can get better at listing out and describing steps of things, important detail versus non-important detail, and just making right. that yeah. that that dissemin uh, to disseminate information properly and concisely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think you're you're hit spot on with that. Is is these exercises are there to help you identify what it is that you're doing well, what you need to improve, and like how to get it concise and evocative. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'd, I'd like to leave off with some some sort of don'ts. There's a lot of do's. We talked about most of them throughout the video, but some don'ts. Do not assume character action at all when you're describing things. In fact, avoid using you in your descriptions. You're going to go mm -hmm. a long way for this, right? He yeah. says, um, you know, don't describe your character. Just describe it. Don't don't make reference to the characters at all when you're describing. Don't describe inner thoughts or reactions from the characters. Mm -hmm. That's another big. You know, big that's flash and don't. One. Yeah, that's, that's a, a huge, huge one. Right. Yeah. And, and you one feel scared as box you text a lot. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You feel a sense of trepidation as you go in this room. How do you know that? How do you know that? Right. As like, opposed to just like it, there is a sense of, of dread and tension in the air. You know, that's, that's it. And here's where, here's how you can see that through the lighting, through the activity, through the mood, that kind of thing. Um, another big one would be, you know, 
don't explain how things work, don't provide definitive answers to things the PCs wouldn't know. Kind of mentioned that earlier. Um, but when you're describing something, keeping it focused on what it is you are want you want to describe, right? What the point of this whole thing is, because when we're when we're dungeon masters, it's easy to go like, oh man, there's all these other things that connect to this, and there's this background stuff the players don't know that's influencing this thing, and you're excited about it. Keep it off the description list. Avoid mundane details. Avoid trivia. Avoid uh, rambling things like that. Keep it focused on what it is you want to describe. And if you sort of abide by those principles, what we've talked about, you're, you're exercising your descriptive capacities. Like, I think this can have a, a huge impact on the quality of your gaming and, and give you a solid foundation of confidence to move forward into more advanced kind of GM techniques and game structures and things like that. Well, that's up, man. That's how you do it.